All right, here we go. We're back for game two. BLG looked very strong in game one. Not, not necessarily any stronger than the draft would have dictated that they would be. They didn't. They didn't accomplish more in the time than we would expect, but they did. They did take their early lead, turned it into Void Grubs, a couple of outplays in the solo positions, and they just took that to a win, and that was enough. This game, we have the return to the Senna Kench. We're going to continue with that scaling, but they have much more fighting pressure early with Xin Zhao and with Zach to try to get in and be that pivot. Three frontliners to try to stick it to BLG. Now we have Corky in response here from Knight to Talia trying to flip this matchup. Uh, this will be an indicator, right? If, if Knight wins both sides of this matchup, then it's going to be a really long series for T1, or I should say a really short series, but a long one for T1. Uh, because, you know, if, you, if you're showing that kind of dominance, the way that we've seen Chovy do, where he just won both sides way back, if you remember, like LeBlanc and Zoe were being tossed back and forth as counters to each other, like who counters who, and then he just won both sides of the matchup. Then he did it again with Galio against Zoe. And that's the sort of level that we think that Knight is capable of playing on. We'll see if that if that comes through. Top lane, Zach is going to have a field day against this Cassante, being able to uh, push and take all fights using his W. Zeus has shown a lot of mastery on this champion, so we're excited to see that. Also, we have a ton of ganks set up. Zach with three abilities to displace and Xin Zhao to follow in and to make sure that there's no follow-up from the team, right? He can zone out that damage. So very nice combination to put together with Senna. Then you have that AP source in the mid lane from Talia, able to wall off fights, which is a big boon to champions like Nami, Xin Zhao, Nar, people that want there to be a finite end to the fight so that they have something to fight against. Um, from the side of BLG, we see the run back on this Renata lane, and they're actually going to go to the lane. So T1 actually saying, we're going to fight you for this. We're going to take it the normal way. We don't want to lane swap away. Let's just see if we can actually match up. Go standard, not try to run away. We gave up a little bit too much on the tank uh, versus the 1v2. And you know what? They're very happy to put Zac into Cassante. So they're saying, are we okay putting Senna into Callista? You should get beat up, right? Pretty badly. Uh, you're going to see level 2 spike here coming in from BLG. They've got the early minion lead, which means that they'll be able to determine how quickly they want level 2. Uh, but it looks like T1 was just trying to bluff this, right? So you do a little bluff, you fight for a bit, you get a couple stacks on your champions, you try to not lose at 2v1. They take perhaps more than they wanted to, but at least Elk was actually hit pretty hard here. You're going to see this ghost being used to track the Xin Zhao. This is a technique that you can use if you're in the losing level one and your jungler is moving away. You want to bluff strength so that the wave stacks a little bit faster so that it crashes onto you so you can actually aim for a level three spike on the turn back wave. This is something that you see from mid lane assassins especially. Now they get to farm up for the safe from the safety of their turret to look for the level three spike. Uh, Callista's going to turn this into an opportunity for a cheaty recall, most likely. See if they can come back with an extra dagger and fight from there. No, actually going for Cull. All right, that's interesting. Saying that we're this much stronger. I didn't see if they went Cull last game. I would have imagined that in a lane swap game would have been the time to go. I didn't actually catch that. You guys have to let me know in the comments if you saw in game one if there was a Cull pickup. But I might have expected something like dagger and refillable potion or just dagger and even probably not control ward but trying to take the maximum amount of damage in into this situation so we have a cheaty recall but senna and tom kench are able to get level three without callista in the lane and now the lane will be slowly pushing back to them but now zinja has full cleared zinja can start moving down skip gromp go for an early 3v2 and they can try to use the wave and the early level advantage to try to fight under the turret in a in a condition where wukong might still be farming all right so th this should be the play for t1 we'll see if they're able to get it for themselves Zach doing his best to continue to fight for the wave. Always fighting Cassante at every moment. You see how this wave is stacking? All right, Zinja is actually going for the simpler path straight to the Scuttle Crab, it looks like. Uh, sometimes they'll skip the Scuttle and go for the dive depending on the timer here. But the fact that this has already crashed in their full health means that Zinja probably skips, but he's going to turn this prio into another reverse clear. Or, or I should say bottom to top clear. And the pressure will mount on the top side again. We'll see if there's any kind of undulation to the play. Hold on. This might be it. 
trying to play around timers on the Wukong respawns, but or the recon, Wukong camp respawns, but you know that he passed from top to bottom. You don't know it, but I think did they know it? I don't. I didn't track. I should be. I'm so hyped for this game. I'm. I'm not going through my fundamentals, guys. All right, Zin Zhao comes. This is the ideal timing, right? Stop hitting the wave. Stop hitting the wave. Just trim the casters. That's all you need to do. Trim the casters. Start stepping ahead. Zin Zhao can come in. He actually doesn't. All right, so with Wukong on the other side of the map, they don't take this advantage to actually freeze them out of the lane. This is a penalty you could have exacted on this team. Perhaps they're doing it because Senna's low on mana. But Wukong's actually going to say, okay, no, we've got the push and they're letting us have it and Xin Zhao retreated. I'm going to use this time to take his Raptors. This is huge for BLG, but at the same time, might this incentivize T1 to go for more of the fights and scale through the bot lane? Wukong is behind Talia. Goes invisible to try to buy as much time as possible. Uh, looks like Corky, they're just doing it as a prank. Uh, pressure gank, right? You're just trying to get in their face a little bit. Two-man knockup, the rarity from Faker. Faker saying, I can play Talia too. Tries to weave in those autos, can't quite get it in. But uh, I can't understate enough that this was a big missed opportunity from Xin Zhao to go and force the freeze right there where you'd have the numbers. Instead saying, I want to path towards topside, I want to be level 5 for the grubs, I want to get them on spawn, especially with Talia pushing through and the fact that they survived the Wukong, that prank was supposed to give you mid prio, and instead it didn't, right? It didn't give them enough. Hold on. Big fight, we get the, oh, we'd get a return. That's so unlucky for them. The arrows time out and they get a kill. This is so big for T1. This movement is fantastic for them. They get the shutdown on Callista. The call will be stacking, but... <sighs> Man, I, I'm not sure how much I like Cole into this situation where you're going to get outscaled. You're going to get outranged. I'd rather be trying to go for maximum kill pressure at all times against this lane. We'll see if it continues coming. Now, not so many slows this game. Senna normally does best with the, with the Swifties versus teams that have extra slows. But it is just generally the best item. You see these movements. Both flashes being used and the fact that they drew the aggro right there. That's unfortunate. That's a tiny, tiny margin to be playing on. And yet it's enough. A faker using the knockback on the wall. The fact that it hit means that you've got a predictable landing spot for your opponent. You can get that guaranteed knockup from that position. All right, Ben's going to try to clear the wave. Let's see if he goes W into all out. There's no way he turns this right. The fact that he traded that, like how unreal is this player, guys? Giga Bin is on a whole nother level. <laughs> it's, uh, it's exciting to watch this guy. You see how well he held for his cooldowns, using as much as he could from his W to hold that steadfast presence. And then, and then finally, when it's time, get that all out, kind of chain CCing, making, making it hard for, for Xin Zhao to move and taking the maximum amount of damage. All right, deep wards here. You see this Wukong on the invade with a control ward means that they're looking to dive. Uh, this is a level six Tom Kench, though. This is notoriously hard to actually dive. He sees the edge of the control ward, maybe. Oh, Tom Kench goes deep, but he misses. Okay, all right. You have to be worried that sometimes you get punished there. The fact that Talia was moving over was definitely the indicator that they want to step back from that fight. Corky's going to collect the package. come on over the fact that they lost prior right at that moment means that they might be a little bit desynced for the package use and here we go on the cooldowns you see the flash being used but he uses the w to disjoint e to the other side gets all the cooldowns in connects q reset another e drags owner under the turret you see how he's moving that way force him to make the choice of you can come and attack me but you're also going to get hit by the turret beautifully done All right, so the fact that the package is down and the dragon goes down, well, let's see, no, no, dragon's in a minute 20. They'll be, no, dragon's in 450, of course. It's the herald, it's the herald in a, in a minute 10. The void mites, my goodness. I'm a little bit tired, guys. This has been a, this has been a hype tournament. Honestly, if I, if I had my, my own way, I would just be resting today. We had a huge, awesome day. I mean, I, I absolutely love it. Gardening for my family feels so good, right? Like homesteading feels amazing. Uh, I highly recommend it if you guys haven't haven't done it, even if you can just get six plants on a roof or something. But um, <sighs> I 
I couldn't I couldn't not watch this game and not broadcast this game because we've been hyping it up the whole time. I wish it were in the finals. And honestly, if there's one thing I could go wrong for BLG is if it's too easy and too quick, where they say this is what we've this is what we've been planning for, like these scrubs. And then if they get loose and then T1's able to turn it on, I don't think that's going to be the happen. Like we said, we've got three one. Maybe T1 gets a game here is is the way that we think of it. Uh, this is probably their best chance at it so far. Definitely better than than first game around. Talia's is getting some good poke, getting good shove off into the corky. Void mites are up, and we're gonna see Xin Zhao prioritize this. And void mites, void mites, best fastest way to victory, guys. Right, the extra pushing power, the fact that you get true damage means that you can chew through the plates even when they get those uh, bulwark fortifications. Getting the fourth one is a big deal. Hold on, we see Handshake versus Faker right here. He's moving along. Gonna be okay, he's got the backup. Tom Kench sent a very, very strong here. Let's see if they move them over. Sometimes you see Senna's come over to Void Grubs because of all the extra spawns that come through, and it looks like BLG is able to fight them off, and they're gonna get two stacks for themselves. So ensuring that there's not six, but you do have the four. Uh, they are playing on patch where this, I think this is the patch, right? They should be getting the Void Mite on spawn. I guess we'll see it in a moment. Yep, there we go. Four, four stacks is enough to get the Void Might spawn, uh, which is just a tiny thing, right? It's a tiny thing, but sometimes it helps you to poke into a damage, into a turret that you might not. And you can see that bleed on the turret, right? That damage over time. It's a significant chunk of damage, guys. And this is, the Void Mites have accelerated the tempo fashion of the game, right? We've always, we've always touted tempo above everything, but now with Void Mites, the fact that you can rotate over and just constantly go for a lead in two lanes. Just have more people than the enemy team in two lanes. Do it all through the game. You push them out of lanes, you hit turrets, you've got void mites, you poison the turret, and you deal more turret damage than they do in the opposite lane, especially if you can get them to do it on bot side of the map, the weakest lane. Great. Sweet, you've got bot lane turrets down. That's not gonna help you secure Baron. It's not gonna help you secure anything that matters on the map at all. So uh, every time that you can, you want to make that trade. We see a T1 getting the first uh, bites off on it. We're gonna try to get more movements and see if they can get these other plates. They've got 10 plates still hanging here. And if they can get out of this with a plate lead against Callista and Renata, they're going to call this a huge win. But I want to see more proactive movements. I want to see them continue to fly through, especially with the Xin Zhao. In this case, it looks like we're going to get a steal. Talia push. Talia has been getting the push off right here constantly. Every single game uh, and every single wave, you're winning, you're winning the push here. Now, interestingly enough, we see Hex Drinker this game from Knight. This game, it's got much less value, right? You're not dealing with double magic damage sources from the mid and jungle. So this is the game where it would have been much, much better to rush Mirror Mana, right? Where you're just saying, I, I just want to stack this item as quickly as possible. It's going to be my first big spike. Yes, I'm versus a mage lane and Hex Drinker is always good, but it really speaks to the fact that Knight is picking up against just Talia means you think that Faker should have picked it up against Talia and Sejuani combination. Uh, these meatballs are going at it. This is level 11, Zach. The extra stats are going to pay off for him. He can basically fight this all day long. He's not going to care. He's also got the Sunfire, which is proccing off. Chewing through that Kanic Rookern. You do want to make sure that if you're getting into an extended train uh, trade against someone with Kanic Rookern, make sure to continue it. Because if all you do is you chew through the shield and then they get the shield back, what have you actually accomplished, right? You have, you're a manaless champion, you're ahead on levels, and you have a free sustain in your kit. That means you want to tax this guy as early and often as possible. Chew through, chew through the Koenig Rookern shield, continue the trade, try to get the Cassante to use up as much of their mana as possible, and turn that into a position of strength. And now you can see that Cassante's on 60% health and 20% mana fighting for the wave, and he's going to be second to recall always means Zach will be first on the map. If they have good timers, they'll know that there's no accessibility for Cassante to this dragon. T1 getting the objective control, Talia with the push, Zach with the push, bot lane even getting in on the action, and they're good. They're good to go right now. Blood song being completed by the Senna right at 14 minutes. We've got 46 stacks.
Oak being hit there. Callista being hit by Talia. I mean, are, are the Talias just cracked right now? Is Are they just that strong? A little bit... Mm, that was an ambitious ultimate from Guma. I, w I wish he didn't cast that. You weren't going to get that kill. Not ever, especially against a Callista. If they were already slowed, even, and you knew that the Q was down, then you'd have a kill. But that's those would be the conditions. Now it just means that you're short that resource for later. But they have been getting enough for themselves. They have a slight gold lead. They've got two dragons for themselves. Uh, they've got the four void mites, that being the most important part. So they're going to continue these rotations, move through the map, try to get Senna access to turret, use the range advantage from Senna, especially while this Corky is not scaled up yet. Once Corky gets to Mirror Mana, uh, it's like a new champion, right? From Mirror Mana on, and then you're going to see Malignants after that. Different champion. Very hard to approach against Corky once you get to that stage. So T1's going to look to press the envelope now. Now, some considerations to talk about. Xin Zhao, very good into this composition. Corky, Renata, and Callista. He can ignore a significant chunk of that damage. If you get the ult up in response to the rend, you can actually deny that as well. T1 putting four people into the northern quadrant. All right, so they go river first. They push the lane. Now they move in. This is classic T1 macro. Interesting that we get the W first from the Talia. Uh, normally, you'd expect that to come after the slow or after the knockup from the uh, the Xinjiao. But Tilia coming back into the fight, this is Faker's favorite angle, by the way. When he plays this, he always goes for this cutoff. He goes and steps right above here and then throws that level 2 ultimate down here. We've seen some Talias skip the level 2 ultimate uh, because all, it, all it's really doing for you is giving you extra range. But that extra range does unlock some exciting potential for where you can wall people off how far you can get into a fight and it really if you're using it and abusing it that's that's what makes talia so much better in pro play than in solo queue because you have that access to fight and you can create fights and seal off fights in a much better way so right here you see the seismic shove being used early was very surprising tanking three turret shots making sure that they get the the upfront damage into night see that the Hex Drinker didn't do much, right? Talia dealt the the upfront bulk of the damage. Hex Drinker never even procced, right? You go to 50% with your mage and then the rest of the sources of damage. And that's why we're saying Hex Drinker much weaker this, this game than it was last game. Good mechanics there by Zach. Elastic Slingshot, the two furthest things away to bring them closer before you W. Just nice, nice, clean, like simple things like that, making sure that you know your champion inside and out. Even though that, you know, that's a fairly basic thing, but just saying, like, even under all this pressure, I'm always going to do the small things right. All right, Tom Kench can be a bully in this lane. Guma's going to try to go continue stacking off. Has 59, one away from being at, at that 60 mark. Could be right now that she gets it. Yep, there we go. There's a beautiful ultimate. That's what you want to get it to. In that corridor, they're moving away from the ult. Tom Kench Berserk actually deals a... A significant amount of damage, but it is kind of fake. Renata ult at level one basically does nothing. You hit people for one attack, and that's it. Later in the game, they may be able to get more, but I don't know if we're going to get later in the game. You've got four Void Mites. Look at that damage chunking in. Sun of Range is coming online. You see the Blood Song and the Opportunity it means they're going to be very, very strong. Tom Kench has finished the Frozen Heart. Nice little answer to Callista. Frozen Heart is actually a slow too for Callista because by slowing her attack speed, you are effectively slowing her move speed. Uh, so that is a way to hold them down. Also, you're going to have attack resets from Wukong that might be interrupted. The fact that you have Callista and Renata synergies on the on hits also being slow. Cassante also relying on it. So this Frozen Heart, I absolutely love. Something I don't love though, the second item lightning jewel here from from talia now this does affect the turret damage okay the turrets have a significant amount of resistances and it does affect your ability to hit through the turrets so that is a big thing but so does ap right and the ap will also go into the wave clear and you don't really have that much stacking going on you're the only real ap threat i mean tom kench and zach are going to deal some amount of damage but you also expect them to get an abyssal mask at some point in this game especially the tom kench 
Uh, or maybe even the Zack. Uh, but anyways, let's watch this fight. We see up front, we get picked out and Corky raking themselves across the across the coals on the ground. They do get the dragon for themselves, but at what cost? They're probably going to lose this entire fight and probably ensuing the game. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that, guys. Four deaths to get in there. This is going to be the... I mean, they get the dragon, but now they lose the Baron in the game. Tom Kench not offering any damage. This is something you can do if you're if you're a tank that or or an assassin that doesn't deal much damage to an objective, then you're fine to go split off into the side lane. Get more for your team depending on the window, right? If it's the difference between your team comfortably getting and getting a good recall. Hold on, we'll watch this fight. Talia with a good way in using that control word. By the way, you see this? Don't hit this ward. They keep this control word down. They make sure that they've got vision in this. This is something you need to do in every single fight. NA is really really bad at this that you just want to place a control ward as the fight is breaking out in the areas where you're fighting. You want to deny vision so that you can kite in and out, potentially live by an attack, right? That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to accomplish in those windows. On these Baron calls, right? The difference being if your team is going to get out-tempoed coming out of base to get to the next thing, then you need to go with them. But in this case where dragon's gone, enemy team doesn't have any weave, waves to speak of to attack. It means that you can go off. Uh, Tom Kench kills the bottom lane turret. Baron is dead. They come back out onto the map and they have all of their structures intact. Nine to three, two dragons to one, four void mites to one. They've got Baron in tow. This is going to be a very, very easy game for them to close out. Now we see Zach in top lane. He's got teleport, so they may move away from him. They're going to try to take this south quadrant vision. Uh, Zun is taking what he can while he can. He's taking this Raptor camp. I like that he's taking this resource away, probably costing T1 a little bit of extra time. Yeah, they're actually losing a lot of extra time here. They do move four people down and Zack to mid lane. So this is this is what we get from the standard rotation. Uh, four here, one here, and then you shift it down. This is a beautiful, beautiful movement. It forces the enemy team to react to you. And you say, all right, what we want to do is fight for this quadrant, right? We're gonna fight for this triangle of vision, but we're gonna do it by starting mid, force you to deal with that. Zach pushes top, he comes on over. This is very, very good wave control. Uh, and one of the answers that you can do to this, depending on how big the wave is, you have to judge where are you in the game? How many levels behind are you? How much stronger are their minions than yours? Is it going to stack up and push for you or is it going to rebound? And if it's going to rebound, there's actually a world where you can just stall, 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 try to defend as best as you can, five man defense, and then go for, and push someone up top and say, all right, now we'll go for four man defense and we'll push with, uh, who would be the best option right here? Corky with teleport out, right? I'm gonna go push. Corky might actually have to be part of the defense. Maybe. Can't really be Callista. Maybe it's just no one on this team, frankly. You need Cassante to be the body. You need Wukong to threaten to, for the all in. Renata, Wukong, and Callista sort of need to be together. So, and Corky's your only range champion to stop the enemy team from just walking in on you. So maybe they don't have it. But in some compositions, if that wave is stacking back up, you have someone like a Kale, for example, that can go out and start pushing that by themselves. All right, Talia putting the wall up. Cassante on the right side of the wall. He actually dashes over. They say, we're just going to seed this. They're five-man defending. They're getting nothing back on the map. There aren't any waves, so they're trying to just stall out this Baron, but they're losing all this gold. Each of these inner turrets, right? This is a 1,000 gold that the enemy team is cashing in on on top of taking control of your, your entire uh, jungle camp spawns. So, yes, you've stopped them from taking the base, but now they've just ballooned this lead to another 2K, right? So we're up 8K now. The Baron has come in. They've taken all three of the inners. The map is theirs to play with. And now they can just fight with their wallets, right? They can take every single fight now. They've got a big enough lead. They'll be able to come over for this. Now, Wukong looks like he's trying to get the Scuttle Crab down. This is a good window for him. They're finally getting something cross map. Knight is recalling here. This makes no sense to me. You need to come over. You need to come hit this, right? You've already got teleport. This is your one and only window to actually hit this turret and get it down uh, because Talia is not going to give you another window to do it. The wave is cleared. Talia backs off. You see this uh, mid lane macro, by the way. You clear and you go away. You make sure that there was no threat. The one thing that they could have been doing is coming into this area. So Talia escapes by going around. 
check that out if you're watching if you're if you're a mid laner on in our academy or if you're one of the students in our classes watch that talia movement again and again and again and again that is so crucial to your mid game macro push the wave the wave's in a good spot you're good now be safe move back to your team and start zoning with them as that control mage All right, T1, drawing line of scrimmage. They have a control ward down here. They're saying we're going to bait you into the area using this rock, uh, potentially using Talia walls to try to segment the enemy team, see if you can get them to go a little too far. You have to be careful with Cassante ults. Zach is never going to be separated for the fight from long. This is a level one ultimate from Renata, also whiffing. Here we go, Corky going through the fight. This is what they want, but they need to turn this into one fight, not two. Good team fight positioning. They do get the first kill, but how much? At what expense? You're going to get the turns. If they get a kill here and the reset on the bailout, they'll be okay. But no, the continuation. Senna dealing a ton of damage here on the back. Zach just super steady. Guma fighting Elk on the on the far side, and they're really not afraid of anything here. This this is just a wallet diff, guys. Big fight. Big, big, big fight. Waves are coming in. Dragon is theirs. Baron is up in 20 seconds. You would, in some situations, you'd say, I'd want to come get inhibitor off of this uh, because of the easy respawn timers. But with three seconds, 10 seconds, and Callista already up, you'd be giving up too much because they could chase you out, force you to waste time on your recall, and then beat you to the Baron pit. Uh, and that's something that you don't want to risk right now, especially versus T1. You see that mage being hit by by hostile takeover just doesn't matter right it's one attack reposition doesn't doesn't do anything the real ultimate will come at level 11 for renata we see this upfront damage beautiful spacing there in the fight you do see the advantage china you see how they got those two control words down even despite being down low you for a moment you were doubting what the result of this fight might have been maybe and a large portion that portion of that came from having a distinct lead in the vision but now t1 can do whatever they want with the map they're going to move up they've got all the gold all the all the outside structures are taken down they can start zoning off they're going to play for vision corky is one of the best champions to get back in a situation like this he can light up the bushes with his q he can throw his rockets in he's got the malignants to make it difficult but what we expect is that t1's going to go for a big fight hold on we get an upfront kill on to senna but at what cost on the backside we see Callista dying uh doesn't get that bailout we see the wallets just taking over on the backside of the fight this is what you don't want again when you split the fight into two the gold lead will be even more pronounced your one big advantage is to try to get them to fight on you under your terms 5v1 i kill i throw one big punch right not five individual fingers but one fist you get one punch in you get a kill then you consolidate and you try to do it again when you split up into three on three and 2v2 it's even more pronounced the lead that the levels and the wallets give because you're three or two champions it's much harder for you to actually secure that kill quickly and then you're fighting against the full item slots when you can get a pick it's like you're not fighting against their items. You just killed the 1600 health and you say, I've killed your carry or I've killed wh whichever champion I'm going for. Your items no longer matter. And then we can wash and we can start again. And now we're playing against an even game because your 8K is gone. So take a look at how they do this. T1 jumps into the middle of the fight. This needed to be a fight in one direction. You see how Bin isn't even in position yet. And also Knight and Elk are moving backwards. So disjointed carries from tanks. Uh, they had the right idea to get up into this. Corky was very strong in this position with the, with the malignance pickup. They had a moment where maybe they could have gotten in without a little bit of that extra poke. Bin was a little bit late. Uh, T1 giving them a window. You know they're saying, "Hey, this is strong enough. We want we generally want to fight, and it's going to have to take a mistake on our part, a little bit bigger than that one, to for it to really matter." Zayus just walking up into the middle of everybody. Oh, Tom Kench, Xin Zhao, Zach, just standing in the middle of the whole fight, knowing that they've got Senna behind them to heal them up and deal damage. They are playing like the pivot, right? You need to be that lead foot for Senna to pivot off of, right? You need to be able to step forward and make sure that Senna can continue to do her thing. If you play back, Senna can't 
play forward and she can't get those chips she can't hit the q it's a good spacing by them two turrets down two inhibitors down control ward to hold their own area this is a little bit too far forward no reason for it to be up this high it could be for a little bit further back and still see exactly the same thing but be out of range of people on the other side you see another one over the gate you make sure to put it in the gate so it doesn't get seen by turrets until he is going to wall off but this is just going to be a sieging wall saying hey you guys can't defend anymore and once this is down zach actually goes in Splits the back line up again, right? This is what we're talking about. Same sort of fight. Look out of this fight. If they can move the fight to the left, they're good. But the first movement from Elk should have actually been to the right. The kiting should have been this way and radially start to fight into the into owner on this side. They are moving the fight this way under the cover. So this is going to be good positioning to start. They may get one kill up front. Bin is deciding to peel for peel Zinjiao and take this 1v1 rather than go into the rest of the fight. And I don't know if I like that decision because there's not that much to go for if you don't have the threat of the continued follow-up, but I'm sure that he's doing it to just make sure that owner can't use the Zinjiao ultimate to just kick people away. But this means that the fight resets, all the gold comes back into play. You don't get that pick. And the wallet diff is coming in. All right, they're going to continue to siege. We're going to see them burst down the turrets now, and this is just going to be a nexus. They're not even going to bother for kills. They might just to like prove a point and be like, hey, we got you. All right, exciting game. Much better from T1. Excited that we have a series on our hands. All right, game three is coming up next.